Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 530, August the 25th, 2018, Saturday morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, before I get started on today's video, um, I just want to first say that if you're new to Towergate, you've only been watching videos for you know a few weeks or maybe even only a few months, uh, I want to highly recommend that you check out the Towergate timeline. Uh, the timeline I have there is uh, will really get you up to speed um, on how we got here today 530 and because a lot of the things that are in my timeline are kind of things that have you know I, I've built my timeline pretty much as the story has unfolded since I first put it together I had to go back obviously uh, and take my notes and tower gate videos that I'd done and when I started putting together my timeline but for a while now it's just mainly been the events that I talk about every day that pertain to the Spygate thing find a way into the timeline. And so you can see with my timeline, uh, it not only starts with the day that I began doing these videos, which was like March uh, the 6th of 2017, but my timeline actually takes you back to the early origins of the Spygate uh, situation, which goes all the way back to 2014. So if you've never looked at my timeline, it takes about an hour to scroll down through and read it all. But point by point by point, event by event, you can see the entire Spygate uh, conspiracy, uh, how it started, and how we got to where we are today. So it, I think it'll fill in, fill in a lot of gaps for a lot of people who are kind of new to uh, Towergate videos. So check out my timeline if you get a chance. Just click on the link. It's right there in the description box. Okay, so um, also I have a lot of comments yesterday because uh, I was, again, we're talking about Jeff Sessions and um, the fact that Lindsey Graham and Chuck Grassley, two fairly key players in the Senate, and it's, it's no accident that they came out and made the comments that they made. I mean, uh, they, I mean, they're kind of setting the stage for them both to come out publicly and suggest that it's maybe time for Sessions to go, and uh, the, or at least the president feels it may be time for Sessions to go. Uh, it's it's pretty it's a pretty major event right there you know so um, it tells us that there is something going on there so a lot of people do comment in the section I know a lot of people here are big fans of Q and follow Q and uh, I guess I don't really follow Q myself uh, but I know a lot of people that I read uh, in the comment section that talk about Q use this phrase uh, trust the plan uh, so I, I guess there's a, a plan and that plan includes uh, Jeff Sessions uh, actually working you know behind the scenes or uh, publicly looking like he's not doing anything but you know uh, under the surface he's actually orchestrating a very serious uh, investigation and then at some point uh, the plan I guess is that Sessions is going to um, come out someday and start indicting all of the uh, criminal conspirators of which there are dozens and dozens and dozens including the former president, most of his cabinet, the head of the CIA, the head of the DNI, the top two, three, four, five people with the DOJ and FBI, and many other bureaucrats around them, as well as confidential informants, spies, agent provocateurs, and all these sorts of things. There's many, many people, uh, uh, people in foreign governments in the Ukraine and the UK. This is a very, very big, big conspiracy. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's what I think we're talking about here. Uh, but I do want to just offer up one uh, point of consideration uh, when you think this thing through about trust the plan, a session is going to come out and unveil it. Okay, so we know that literally every day Trump is really going off on sessions and it gets worse and worse every day. And he's very, very specific about what he's talking about. He's very specific about the fact that he thinks that Mueller is conducting a witch, witch hunt and Sessions is allowing it to go on. He's very specific about the fact that the rotten Reverend Clinton uh, clearly violated the Espionage Act, committed all these crimes. You have the Clinton Foundation, all this corruption, and he sees nothing being done. And he's telling Sessions, you should be uh, prosecuting this or investigating this. He points out the dossier, Christopher Steele, the corruption at the FBI and the DOJ. He points all this stuff out very specifically, literally every day, and it gets worse and worse and worse as he applies more and more pressure. So um, I guess what we would have to believe, because keep in mind, if Sessions 
or conducting a, a, a serious investigation into people like Obama, the rotten Reverend Clinton, James Comey, uh, the top two, three people at the FBI, the top, you know, the CIA director, uh, the, the DNI, um, most of, uh, of Obama's uh, cabinet, uh, people with the National Security Council, people like Susan Rice and Samantha Power, uh, um, Victoria Newland, and all these people. If Sessions was actually conducting a real serious investigation of these people and had convened grand juries and was pr producing evidence against these people and all this was going on, and it would have to be if there were an investigation going on, right? I mean, an investigation involves all these things. Uh, uh, grand juries, presenting evidence, uh, getting testimony from all these people. If that were happening, I think it would be very, very difficult for it not to be known within the Beltway um, by people. These are very powerful people. They, if the, this type of investigation were going on, I think it would be very difficult to keep it quiet. But I can tell you for a fact that even if they were able to keep it completely concealed from the public so that, so that none of us knew that any of these people were actually being investigated and grand juries were convened and evidence was being looked at and witnesses were being called, uh, if all this were happening, I absolutely guarantee you that the president would know it. The president is the head of the executive branch. The uh, head of the DOJ, the attorney general, would not pursue an investigation of this magnitude, uh, or any magnitude for that example, uh, uh, or for that matter. He would not uh, pursue this type of investigation without the president knowing about it. Uh, there's no way that the Attorney General would conduct this type of investigation and just pop up one day and, and come out with all these indictments and surprise the President. Hey, surprise, I've been in investigating all these people and now here come the indictments. The President is the head of the executive branch. The Attorney General works for him. Um, the President doesn't get involved in these investigations, not supposed to, but the Attorney General would be obligated uh, to make the President aware of investigations, especially an investigation like this one going on. I just, I see no way that the president and his staff and the people around him would not know if the attorney general were conducting a serious investigation into these high level people with grand juries and witnesses and evidence and these things. It would be very impossible, very, very difficult to keep that from the president. Um, but let's just say that everything we're being told is true. Let's just play, let's see how this plays out. Okay, so let's just say a couple weeks or months from now, um, Sessions comes out to the podium and has a press conference and announces the indictment of the rotten Reverend Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Loretta Lynch, Susan Rice, uh, James Comey, James Clapper, and, and a list and a host of people, Strzok, Page, uh, Baker, you know, you go right on down the list. Uh, Mr. Halper, <laughs> uh, and all, all these people, right? Okay, so what would happen then? Well, then the next thing that would happen is once people learned about all these indictments and once the um, court hearings begin and the prosecutions and the things begin, it would become revealed to the public that this entire time, the past year, year and a half, two years, that Sessions has actually had an investigation going on. Now, the president would have had to have known about it. There's no way that you could con conduct an investigation, have all these indictments come down, and all of a sudden the president is completely clueless, doesn't know, and all of a sudden he finds out just like everyone else. See, that's not believable. Um, the president would definitely know if there was an investigation of this magnitude and indictments coming down on these people. Uh, there's just no way you could keep that from the president, okay? But probably couldn't keep it from the local media in D.C. These people are too high profile. Uh, you know, conducting these investigations would be very difficult to do and keep it completely quiet. Uh, hard to do from the public and the press, let alone the president of the United States. So what we'd be faced with at that point is that we would have a situation where we would learn that the president and the Attorney General played a game with us where the President constantly ripped the Attorney General every single day uh, about his performance or lack of performance of his job and for not prosecuting these criminals. 
And then one day the attorney general comes out and, and, and prosecutes these people. And uh, so it would be revealed that there was a game running, that there was a game between the president and the attorney general. They knew that they had this investigation going on, but they played this little game where Trump attacked Sessions because they wanted to lure the Democrats into you know, complacency or whatever the excuse may be. Um, see, the problem with that is that once the public learned that the attorney general had been conducting this investigation and that he and the president knew and that they were in cahoots running this little charade, this little good cop, bad cop routine <clears throat> for over a year, year and a half, that would be very, um, it would look not good. Let's just say it would not look good. It would look very deceptive. It would look like, you know, that shouldn't happen. The president and the attorney general shouldn't be running a game, running a charade uh, during some sort of an investigation like that. Um, you know, if, if Trump were completely silent and not ripping Jeff Sessions and not running this, this good cop, bad cop routine, then you could say, okay, they just kept it very quiet. The president didn't talk about it. The attorney general didn't talk about it. But that's not what's happening. It's a very loud conversation right now between Sessions and Trump, mostly coming from Trump. So I, I think it would raise a lot of questions if if the day that Sessions does the indictment and then we start learning that this investigation has been going on and that Trump had to know about it, that means that they were running a, a charade the whole time. And that in itself would raise some very, very serious questions as to, you know, uh, the kind of deceit and this kind of game that should not be happening. A president and attorney general shouldn't be playing, you know, a good cop, bad cop routine for the public uh, to deceive them about an investigation uh, that may or may not be going on. You see, this would be very, very problematic. And even if Trump, this is something Trump would probably do, it's right down his alley. I mean, it's total theater. It would be great, you know, Academy Award winning type stuff. The problem is, I don't think Jeff Sessions would do it. I don't think Jeff Sessions would be, yeah, let's do a good cop, bad cop routine. You pretend to hate me while I, can, while I will run a secret investigation and we'll just run this whole routine. You see, it's, it's, it sounds good, you know, in a book or a novel, a movie maybe would be interesting storyline. But in all reality, I, I have a rough time with it. But again, I, if those of you out there who, you know, think that this is plausible, that this could happen or would happen, then, you know, I'm good. I'm just offering uh, some uh, something for you to, uh, you know, to think about uh, in this regard, about the plan and everything. But it's all good. Again, as I've said many times, I hope you're absolutely correct. I hope it turns out that Q is right. There's a master plan. Sessions drops the hammer. That'd be great, man. That's what I'm working for every day. So, you know, please, I mean, break my heart. <laughs> I'll be the I'll be the person laughing the loudest and the longest and. Uh, I will love it more than anyone, believe me. But just something to think about. Okay, I want to say thanks to Joe Mack for leaving a really good link. Um, I don't know how many of you look at realclearinvestigations.com. Realclearinvestigations.com. Paul Speary writes a lot there. A lot of his good articles have been written there. And as you all know, I'm a big fan of Paul Speary because he has great sources. Uh, he has a lot of people on the inside. He's been around the Beltway for uh, many years. And uh, he's pretty hooked into a lot of establishment people, but he's been outside the establishment for a long time as well. So anyway, uh, he does great articles, great journalism. And uh, so anyway, if you want to check out this article, Joe Mack left the link. So what the article is about is it's really a very, very intensive, and it's a long article, by the way. It takes a while to read it. Most of his, A lot of his articles are. Paul Speary does write pretty long articles, but he lays out a lot of facts and a lot of evidence. And so in this particular article, what he's talking about is um, the bottom line is that the uh, laptop of Anthony's Wiener that contained the 894 or 694,000 emails on it was never actually reviewed by the FBI. Comey said it was. He lied under oath. One of many lies. That's like line number six or seven. I've lost track. Um, so Paul Sperry, though, what he does in this particular article, he really lays out the entire history of the Rotten Reverend Clinton um, and the Anthony Weiner laptop situation. It's really uh, it, it's dominated by the fact that 
uh, Hillary's emails were on Anthony Weiner's laptop, but he gives you all the history, and he relies, uh, I'd say, about 80% of uh, his his article relies on uh, the recent uh, Inspector General report by Huckleberry Horowitz, which we got recently, and a lot of redactions, but then we got a cleaner version of it. So the report by Horowitz, um, as well as uh, he refers to a lot of text from Strzok and Page and some other text that we've uh, been privy to see. And uh, I'd say that's 80% of what's in the article. So in other words, things that we've seen before, uh, he just puts them into the context and the timeline. <clears throat> About 20% of the article is new information or uh, information that's been confirmed uh, through his sources, which are fairly new things that we learned. So there's some new stuff in there, but it's mostly using the IG report and the text and putting that to a timeline and then explaining exactly what did happen, um, the truth, uh, as best as we can tell what happened with the emails that were discovered, the 694,000 emails that were discovered on Anthony Weiner's computer and how it was handled by uh, Comey, the Department of Justice. And the fact that of these 694,000 emails, only about 3,000, a little over 3,000 were actually looked at. So Spiri lays out how all this played out. Um, and it's a really good article, it takes some time to read, but it's really good. Um, he focuses mostly on the fact that I guess his newer information, uh, some stuff we haven't really heard before, is that um, is that if you remember, Comey comes out. Okay, what happens? And he's referring to the a lot into the IG report at this point, you know, which is what the IG report told us that Comey. Let's go even earlier than that. The Southern District of New York, investigating Anthony Weiner, finds hundreds of thousands of emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop that were referencing or reference to or emails of the rotten Reverend Clinton. And as we saw in the original texts, that when they discovered these things, they had what they called their oh shit moment, okay? At which point, they're forced to move forward here in the Southern District of New York and say, okay, we got this evidence now. What do we do? And they said, well, we got to look at it, you know? So they began to look at it and uh, eventually there was a case officer assigned to it and people in the Southern District of New York looking at it, they were not able to deduplicate uh, the 694,000 emails because of uh, problems with um, the metadata being corrupted and not even being present. So anyway, they give possession of, it, of the laptop to McCabe, who sits on it for several weeks, three, about three weeks or so, three and a half weeks. Somewhere in that time period of three and a half weeks, Peter's been stroking us, uh, McCabe gives this to Peter's been stroking us and these two female lawyers, this um, uh, Moyer, Mary Moyer, and uh, this other uh, what's her name? Uh, forget her name. But the, the two the two the two female lawyers, the DOJ and Peter's been stroking us, essentially gain custody of that laptop, uh, which is given to them by McCabe. So between them, they sit on it for three and a half weeks. Then the case agent down in the Southern District of New York and the other people who, who know about what's on this Wiener laptop become very concerned because they're thinking, uh oh, they're they're not um, Comey is not doing anything with it. They're gonna try to sit on it and when it's discovered, what they're going to do is they're gonna scapegoat me or us here in the Southern District of New York. So this case agent goes to his people higher ups in the Southern District District of New York and complains, Hey, I'm not gonna be a scapegoat for this you know, you need to make some phone calls. You need to find out what's going on because the, you know, people need to know that there's hundreds of thousands of Hillary Clinton emails on this pervert Anthony Weiner's laptop. It's a problem. A lot of that stuff, it could or may be classified. So at this point, we learn from Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz that the pressure begins to build on Comey and McCabe because uh, Mr. Laufman, uh, who is at the, I guess, uh, DOJ NSD, gets a call from a high-level person in the Southern District of New York. He says, hey, my agents are not particularly happy about what's going on. You guys are sitting on this laptop with all this information. The election's coming up. You, you cannot sit on this. And I, and I can tell you right now that if, 
if we don't see something happen here soon, very soon, <clears throat> I you know you're going to have leaks. So both Laufman and Baker uh, tell Comey, look, you got a big problem. The guys down in the Southern District of New York uh, are getting ready to start leaking to the media that you're holding this laptop with hundreds of thousands of Hillary Clinton emails. So this forces Comey's hand. That's why Comey was forced to come out. And uh, we didn't actually come out, if you remember, I didn't actually come out and have a press conference right away. What he actually did is he wrote a memo to the heads of several committees, friendly to the Rotten Reverend Clinton, of course, and he alerted them that they had stumbled onto some new information and there would have to be a little more looking into of the email situation. So he kind of did it on the down low, but it didn't take long for that to be leaked to the media, which stirred them up, in which case it forced him to come out and make a, a, a presentation, a speech, or what have you, a statement. Comey comes out, and that's when he announces, okay, we've had to reopen the Hillary Clinton email investigation because we've found all these emails on the, on the Wiener laptop. Then, of course, about three or four days later, after telling us he found 700,000 emails, close to it, 694, that they had been able to perform some wizardry, wizardry, and they had been able to look at all the emails, and Hillary was all good, no problem, everything's good. And then he exonerates the rotten Reverend Clinton again, and then a couple of days later we have the election, and she loses. But the backstory and what Speary uh, tells us in this article is that we learned how Comey covered his butt, or is attempting to cover his butt. And the way he did it was that once he was forced to reopen this investigation because of the Rotten Reverend Clinton's 694,000 emails on the laptop, um, what Comey did was he was forced to come out and reopen it. But what he did was when he issued the search warrant for the laptop, he, he gave tremendous restrictions. Uh, a lot of things that he wouldn't let them look at. He only allowed them to look at very specific certain things. Nothing having to do with any emails between Huma and Hillary. None. So it was purely just some State Department emails that they were looking at, and that's it. He also restricted the time frame, even though the emails went all the way back to 2006. Um, so here you can see that um, Comey, basically what he did was he... he put a very limited search warrant out there on the on the laptop so that it would only be a tiny amount of the emails that would need to be looked at and um, which was a little over 3,000 and so that's kinda how Comey's covering his butt that if he gets called on this sitting on this wiener laptop and not really looking at it that's his cover is to say well you know in the warrant, we were looking specifically for these things, and we looked at those emails, and that's what we're looking for, and the rest of it we, we weren't looking at because it wasn't pertinent to the investigation. That'll cover his butt for the most part, you know? It, you know, it's not right, and it's, it's obviously criminal, but, you know, it's one of those things. He, he's the FBI director. If that's all he wanted to look at, you can argue whether or not, uh, we can certainly argue that he should have, that there was criminal intent and various other things, probably Clinton Foundation evidence on there of wrongdoing, all these things. But um, the, specific, the specificity of the warrant is what allowed there to be such a, 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 a um, weak effort to look at the information on the laptop. And, of course, Paul Speary also uh, says in the article that, uh, as far as he can tell, according to uh, FBI officials, the laptop has essentially been returned to either uh, a Wiener or Abaddon, one of the two, uh, have had the, the laptop returned to them. Uh, whether or not they still have a copy of what was on that laptop, I don't know. But uh, what we do know is that of the 694,000 emails, only about a little over 3,000 were actually looked at. But Comey didn't say that. He didn't tell us the number. He made it sound like when he came out and exonerated her for the second time that due to the wizardry of the people at the FBI, that they were able to uh, look at these emails. When in fact, uh, the people who were holding the laptop uh, during the time period that it was at the main FBI uh, would have been McCabe, Peter's been stroking us, uh, this uh, uh, Galhar, whatever her name is, something Galhar, female lawyer, and this uh, Miss Moyer, the female lawyer. So two female lawyers from the DOJ, Peter's been stroking us, and uh, McCabe, all sitting on this uh, Wiener laptop and Comey likely knowing about it, as well as Laufman, Baker, and other people, quite a few people. Uh, knew about this this laptop, 
but it was in the possession mainly of Peter Benstrokers and the two female lawyers, who are not forensic analysts or experts. The experts at the FBI lab in Quantico said they could not be deduplicated. Uh, and if anybody could perform any wizardry, it would have been them. But we also have another document that now Spiri doesn't talk about, which I talked about two weeks ago, about this other document we got, which is shows Peter's been stroking us, issuing the laptop to another department of the FBI for it to be looked at. And we can see the date on that is the day after the election, the date after Trump won the election and Hillary lost. And we can also see <clears throat> on that paperwork where it asks if the lap laptop had uh, had any previous um, work done on it, had it been looked into previously, anything previously been done uh, to investigate the laptop. And in that box, Peter has been struck and wrote none, N-O-N-E. N -O -N -E. So he's telling them as he's sending this laptop off, the Wiener laptop, the day after the election, that uh, here, take a look at this laptop. No one's looked at it before. And there's his signature right on there uh, with the paperwork submitting the laptop. Spiri didn't put that in his article probably because he either personally he doesn't know about it or he personally could not source it. And if he can't personally source it, he probably didn't put it in his article. But w whichever you know way you want to look at it, uh, what we do know, uh, it's a great article, and what we do know is that Comey seriously misled everyone on exactly how they handled that laptop, what they knew, and when they knew it. A lot of that's in the IG report, but uh, this was not in the IG report. So that is a very good article. Thank you, Joe Mack, for leaving the link. And uh, if you guys want to take a look at it, it's on Towergate Day 529, the link by Joe Mack to realclearinvestigations.com, Paul Spiri. Okay. Let's see if we got a little bit of time left for some other things. In that Trump interview that Trump did with that uh, little blonde girl from Fox News, uh, who's on the Fox Morning Show, he revealed a piece of information that I don't think that anybody has ever had before. Uh, he revealed in that interview, not only did he say that he, you know, felt like he was going to have to, you know, declassify all these documents and things like that, which was an interesting thing to hear him say and tells you what he's thinking. Um, but he actually said that he was explaining something and he said and he said that it was Rosenstein, Rodenstein, I call him Rodenstein, Rodenstein who recommended Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray to be the head of the Federal Bureau of I'm With Her. That's the first time I've ever heard that. There's been a lot of speculation about why he hired Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray and now we know. He told us because Rod Rodenstein referred him. Rod Rodenstein said, hey, here's your man. He's next in line. Deep State Christopher Ray. Now we know. Rodenstein. My, my. Well, the family of Senator Magoo has announced that he's going to end his uh, any, any further treatments. It appears that uh, Senator McCain is probably on his last few days uh, Certainly, I don't even think he's got weeks. I think it's much less than that now. So I guess uh, the only thing you can say at this point is uh, that you can only hope that this uh, that the tumor, uh, who has been unfortunately living in John McCain's head for quite some time, will finally uh, have some peace and comfort and uh, will suffer no more. It's been, I'm sure, grueling for that tumor to have had to have lived in Senator Magoo's head uh, for so long. Uh, which is an ordeal that I wouldn't wish on anyone. And uh, so you can finally at least take some comfort in the fact that um, he'll be out of his, uh, this tumor will be out of its misery and uh, will uh, pass peacefully. So kind of a reverent moment, isn't it? The tumor is passing away. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, you hate to see, you know, something like that happen, but, you know, people are, in this case, the tumor is put out of its misery. I guess there's some, uh, some good to be had there. Adam Waldman, Adam Waldman, who's up to his eyeballs in Spygate, the attorney for Assange, for Christopher Steele, for Deripaska, was working as a middleman between 
uh, those three and the Senate Intelligence Committee, the most corrupt in, uh, committee in the Congress, the deep state, uh, working with his buddies. Um, he was um, requested to appear in front of the committee, uh, Chuck Grassley's committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and um, his lawyer sent a letter back to Grassley saying, sorry, uh, my client, Mr. Waldman, is uh, in Europe on business. He's going to be there for a while, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to make any arrangements for him to testify. Sorry. Well, guess what happened two days later? Two days later, Adam Waldman's wife posted a pic on Instagram of her and her husband, Adam Waldman, and two friends standing in front of a New York City restaurant. So two days after his attorney writes his letter saying he's in Europe on business and won't be back for a while, we see that he's actually in New York City having dinner with his wife and friends just two days later. He's not in Europe after all. He lied. His lawyer lied. My guess is Grassley's already fired off uh, a pretty nasty letter and advised him, don't you leave the country. We know you're here. You're getting a big fat subpoena. And uh, we will enforce it. Mr. Waldman doesn't want to talk, but Mr. Waldman is going to talk. Believe me. They're going to get, he's too instrumental in all of this. Uh, he is definitely going to be um, uh, talked to at some point. And the fact that he just lied to Grassley, you can bet they're really going to turn the screws on him now. <laughs> you can bet on that. ABC is reporting that Bruce Orr acted alone, acted on his own, and that Sally Yates and other superiors were kept in the dark about his activities. I have a rough time believing that, that Sally Yates and all the others involved in the coup, that she would not know that the, that the man right below her uh, was, you know, she's his boss and she's involved in all this too. How in the world she would not know about his wife working at Fusion G GPS, passing info to him, which being passed to the FBI. She's working on all this stuff. How she would not know what Orr was doing is hard to imagine. The only thing I can think of at this point is that they've gone to Bruce Orr and said, well, you're busted, pal. They got the emails, they got the text, they got it all. You're going down. But hey, we control the Department of Justice in the deep state. We can make sure that you don't get prosecuted. You probably get fired, though. Probably lose your security clearance. But you know what? As long as you keep your mouth shut and take the rap, we will make sure that DOJ doesn't prosecute you and we'll set you up for the rest of your life. And you'll make a fortune. We'll pay you off. We'll pay you whatever it takes. You know, you just keep your mouth shut and let it end with you. Plead guilty to the things that you did. You'll get a probably fired, lose your security clearance, but we'll make sure the DOJ doesn't prosecute you. You and Nellie will be just fine. You're not going to jail. In fact, you're going to get quite wealthy as a result of keeping your mouth shut and not dropping the dime on anyone above you. That's probably the deal that's been cut with Bruce Orr. Be my guess. Roger Stone says that Mueller is planning on indicting Trump Jr. Well, that'll certainly up the ante, won't it? Won't it? I would think so. I would think if you go after Trump Jr., one thing to go after Trump, if you go after his kids, that could get pretty ugly. That's quite a move. Of course, we have Ocasio, Marty Feldmanize Cortez, saying that Americans are dying from global warming. That's, of course, insanity. The fact is that uh, we are just coming out of an ice age. The ice ages last. Uh, there is typically an 11,000 year, every 11,000 years we enter a new ice age. So it's 5,500 years entering an ice age. You, you get to the ice age, then you have 5,500 years as you move away from the ice age into the next ice age. Uh, this has been going on for a very, very long time. And the fact is, we just came to the very end of the uh, bottoming out of the uh, end of the first, uh, the, 50, uh, the last 5,500 uh, year cycle. So it has been warming uh, because it's the end of the cycle. But now, within the next uh, 10 to 20 years, we will now begin the process of moving toward the next 5,500 year cycle ice age. So we are now beginning to move into a cooling period. And about three to 4,000 years from now, there will be uh, glaciers covering two-thirds of America, just like there was 6,000 years ago or whatever. 
because this is what always happens. Ocasio Cortez, you're you're nuts, and you're not very wise. But anyway, we're out of time. Thanks so much for tuning in. I will be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See ya. Bye.